So I'll be talking about some joint work uh, we've been doing with Aztec as part of Nouns DAO's private voting research sprint. Um, so just as a summary, we have this token-based voting system, so one NFT, one vote. Um, we have voter anonymity for the uh, duration of the voting process and beyond, so you shouldn't be able to correlate votes with the actual voters. The votes themselves are private for the duration of the voting period and then revealed at the end. And finally, everything is verified on-chain. So just as an introduction, I'll talk about the design from a high level. So first of all, from the front-end perspective, you basically acquire an NFT that gives you, you know, membership in a DAO or some voting power, right? One NFT, one vote, as I mentioned. You have to enroll to vote. So it's assumed everybody in the DAO has registered in a certain sense, and I'll talk about it in a moment. And then somebody creates a voting process, people vote. The votes are actually encrypted with a certain um, key pair whose public key is revealed at the start and private key is revealed at the end via a time lock service, which I won't go into detail on, but that's something that, that was a component of our project, a massive one actually. Um, so private key revealed, decrypt votes, compute results, publish them. Um, and you know, everything is kind of uh, made more solid by ZK proofs, um, which I'll elaborate on in a moment. And on the back end, basically each of these steps, except for the starred ones, involve running some computation, generating a ZK proof, submitting that together with appropriate public inputs. Some of the public inputs can actually be obtained on chain, so that's you know extra, um, yeah, makes it extra solid that way. Um, smart contract verifies proof, and then something is done, some data is stored, some data is emitted in the form of logs. So, and uh, well, let's. Have a quick look at, well, just a quick refresher on blocks in Ethereum. So this is all happening on Ethereum. Blocks kind of look like this, you know, the usual linked list picture. Um, inside each block, we have a so-called state root that basically resolves addresses uh, down to account data, right? And uh, via, you know, Merkle Patricia tries. And essentially, to prove you have some data in some account, you can basically start from the root of this uh, try and go down to the account where you have yet another try, the storage try. And uh, so in, the in our case, what we want is we want all voters to prove their eligibility in zero knowledge. And that basically involves proving that you have an NFT and you've registered to vote. So in this, you know, for this example, you're kind of, you're resolving the address of one of those contracts. And uh, once you actually get to the account, you have to go through the storage try to actually get at the value you want. So you want to resolve NFT ID to address, in the case of proving ownership of an NFT, or you want to resolve an address to a certain public key. Public key not being the public key of your you know, wallet, but uh, so purpose-built public key that's snark friendly. So that's kind of like the gist of what's going on. And this is very expensive in a snark because to actually resolve these keys, you have to you know, take this hex string and basically go one letter at a time decompose it. You also have to compute Ketchak hashes to make sure everything is, you know, legit. So it's quite expensive to do in a snark. Um, so let me talk about the implementation in more detail. Maybe it'll start making, maybe it'll make more sense in that case. Um, so we have the Ethereum blockchain. We have some fixed NFT contract. We have some ZK snark proving system with an embedded curve, possibility of on-chain verification. In our concrete case, it's uh, Ultra Planck via Noir. Um, the embedded curve is Baby Jub Jub, uh, primordial subgroup of Baby Jub Jub. Um, we have some ZK snark friendly hash function. Um, so in our case, it's Poseidon, or Poseidon in quotation marks, because uh, the form of Poseidon usually used is you fix a, an input length, and then you apply the permutation, then you project, which is technically not exactly a hash function the way it's defined, but that's the one we use. And then we have an additional hash function to aggregate ballots, and that's, that also happens to be Poseidon. And we assume given some time lock service for verifiably random key generation to be able to encrypt our votes for the duration of the voting period. So the contracts involved, so we have essentially these contracts. We have a registry contract. So that contains uh, pairs of addresses and public keys necessary to, um, to, basic, to basically sign your ballots um, and also compute a nullifier. 
We also have a voting contract, which contains the specifics of the various voting processes, so process number, IPFS link to a proposal, um, vote choices period, the time lock public key. Um, as votes come in, they're aggregated in the sense that you basically uh, keep a running hash of the encrypted ballots that come in. This is uh, necessary for computing the results and verifying that actually all of the ballots have been counted. All ballots are logged, not stored. And we have some verifier smart contracts to basically verify these, uh, these proofs. So here's how registration works. You connect your wallet. You generate a private key, private baby jub jub key, by signing a certain message from your wallet. And then you compute the corresponding public key and submit that to the registry contract. So why do we do this? Because using your private key in a snark is probably not a good idea. I mean, you can't really do the snark stuff on a hardware wallet. And this was kind of our approach to getting around that. So this approach is used in several other places. Um, seems to be a standard technique. Um, and then for voting process creation, so here's where things get a bit tricky. So what you want to do is you want to take a census at the moment of voting process creation to say, hey, everybody who's registered up until this point, everybody who owns the NFT is eligible to vote. So we t essentially take a snapshot of the blockchain. Now, on the blockchain itself, in smart contracts, you cannot get the state route or the storage route. All you can get is the block hash of one of the past few blocks, right? So what you do is, when you create your voting process, you obtain all the necessary information via you know, RPC, and then you put together a succinct proof. In our case, it's the ZK proof, but it only has to be succinct, that uh, all these routes you get are actually consistent with the current block hash. And then you submit this succinct proof to the smart contract together with the data the smart contract doesn't have. And then the smart contract's going to verify that this proof is legit and accept these values and store them. At the same time, you also call out to that time lock service to obtain a public key to encrypt votes with. And of course, you, you, you supply all the necessary voting parameters. And then when each person comes to vote, what they do is they compute a couple of signatures. They basically sign their NFT ID together with the ID of the voting process, including blockchain ID and so on, using this baby jub jub uh, private key. They also sign, um, sign their uh, vote choice, and they compute a nullifier by hashing one of these signatures, so to prevent double voting. We generate a random one-time private key and use that together with the, uh, baby, uh, together with the uh, time lock public key to compute a shared secret, which is used to encrypt the vote. And so the vote can only be decrypted once the private uh, time lock key is revealed, because we're going to throw away this random private key. And of course, you fetch storage proofs, basically proving that you own the NFT, uh, that you have enrolled to vote. You generate a ZK proof verifying all of this. Submit everything to the smart contract. I mean, everything that's public, at least. Smart contract verifies everything. And then it logs your ballot according to the ID of the voting process. The um, the uh, pu public key corresponding to this one-time private key, and your encrypted ballot. And then at the end of the voting process, the private key has just shown up out of thin air. Um, so you can actually decrypt all the ballots, compute the results, compute the aggregation of all the ballots, put a ZK proof together that everything is good, and submit it to the smart contract, and then the smart contract will take care of the rest. So this approach is not without its drawbacks. So for example, to obtain those storage proofs on the last slide, I mean, if your voting process is longer than you know, an hour or two, then um, you can't necessarily ask any Ethereum node for that data. You'll need an archive node. But everybody uses Infura, so we're OK, right? <laughs> um, Try proofs are very expensive in a ZK snark. So lots and lots and lots of constraints. It takes minutes to generate proofs for all of these things. So you know. It's a bit tricky. And Ultraplunk helps a lot with that, with the lookups. Um, and gas, yeah, we're talking several hundred K. Um, and also, um, whale sightings are possible, because one NFT, one vote. So it might be possible to correlate you know, votes to certain whales. So saving the whales is one of the, yeah, one of the things we need to look into. So the outlook is to, uh, all of this actually happens natively on your computer. We have a CLI prototype online. It's all on GitHub. Um, we're hoping to move this to the browser with, you know, recursive, with recurs recursion in uh, Noir. Maybe look into some kind of relayer service to save the whales, optimization, and integration into DAO solutions like Aragon's DAO framework. 
So yeah, um, if you're interested in learning more, uh, this QR code takes you to our research blog, and you can reach me on decentralized social media. Thank you for your attention. Thanks a lot. And also perfectly on time. I'm impressed. <laughs> so we have time for questions. Yes. Hi. Uh, so uh, two questions on my side. Um, so the first one is around the uh, tallying of the votes. Uh, do you have to reveal the private key before you actually start counting the votes and like determining like who won or who lost or whatever the, the outcome. And the second one is regarding uh, the Poseidon hashing function that you mentioned. Uh, you did it in like quotation marks and then described something that really wasn't like hashing. Uh, did you roll out your own like hashing function for this? Okay, so I'll answer the f so first question was about the uh, private key. Absolutely required, yeah, I mean, yeah. to actually decrypt the votes. Um, so the idea is there would be some time lock service um, so we have this, this solution, this blockchain-based solution, where you can essentially call out and request a private key at some later time, and it should be trustworthy if at least one party is honest. So it's called a time lock service. We, you can read up on that on our blog. As for Poseidon, we didn't roll out our own. So we use, uh, the, the implementation we use is equivalent to CIRCOM's implementation. It seems to be the de facto standard hash function, even though it's not technically a hash function. Um, it's not the sponge. It's not the one in the paper. But it's you know, part of it. More questions? So this is a prototype, I guess. So any ideas like when could someone use this kind of thing in production? It's a good question. Um, I mean, uh, so from the si so apart from the time lock service, I would say actually pretty soon. So the short answer is pretty soon, but that depends on how much you're willing to tolerate the long proving times and the amount of gas you have to pay. So technically, most of this is sound. Uh, I mean, <laughs> we're pretty close. So you know, soonish, like within the next year, <laughs> in theory. <laughs> uh, there are a few technical issues that need to be addressed, um, but. Yeah, for the most part, I would say very soon, in theory, with enough funding, et cetera. <laughs> yeah, someone would want, have to want this, yeah, with the... Yeah. With the <laughs> so can you say a bit more what your use cases, what use cases you would envision? For well, I mean, private DAOs, DAO, well, DAOs where you want any form of privacy. I mean, that was kind of Noun's motivation, extra privacy. Um, with, with, so within, without sort of re, I guess, redeploying your, your, your DAO, this, so this can kind of like plug in rather easily to an existing DAO setup. That's, that's kind of what we envision, yeah. Feasible to support uh, weighted uh, voting with uh, this protocol? Hmm, weighted voting. <sighs> Potentially. I mean, at the moment, yeah, we're kind of implicitly doing like NFT ownership weighted voting. But um, in theory, yes. Okay, thanks. Okay, last question. And maybe the next speaker can already come up to stage, please. Yeah, thanks. Um, was the choice around going with like results revealed at the end? Was that a re result from Noun's perspective of the, that was the requirements they wanted? Or was this the simpler solve technically? No, I think it was one of their requirements. I am fairly sure it was, right? Yeah, I've yeah because you mentioned it's interesting you mentioned like you need users to because yeah, I've got one potential user who wants shielded as in revealed and one who just doesn't understand that and just wants it always to be anonymous. Um, so yeah, I'm interested in both implementations. Okay. 
I mean, it would be possible to, to do it without, yeah, I mean, without the, yeah, it doesn't simplify things in any case, yeah. All right, so yeah, thank you, Amat. Let's Thanks. thank him again.